Hi everybody, welcome to the first lecture on computer animation. My name is Gerald Schuller. So first, some general notes. Um, so usually we have the format of two semester hours lecture and then two semester hours seminar, altogether five credit points. So the lectures um, this semester will be online and the seminar partially online and partially in presence. Yeah, the regular slot for the lectures is 3 to 4.30 and um, I plan to upload the videos just before the lecture so that you can watch them during the lecture time slot and then at the end of the lecture time slot I plan for each lecture a question and answer lesson session live in um, online which I announce on Moodle. So that also means you all need to register in Moodle so that we can communicate. Yeah, so the seminars will be at different time slots now. So um, again, look at Moodle uh, where the time slots are advised um, by our um, seminar um, leader, which is Oleg Golokolenko. Right, um, so we have English and German translations of the slides. So here for the videos I use the English versions, um, but you can also find the German versions on Moodle online. Um, so in general, here you could, for instance, use online uh, translators, but they have varying quality. Yeah, so in the seminars you will obtain homework assignments right um, and the homework assignments are checked and scored in the following seminar so maybe we could I should sort all this is assigned right oops yeah and from the homework 30% um, of the points from the homework are included in the final grade and 70% comes from the final exam at the end of the semester. There are also small tasks in the Moodle 2 systems. So usually um, after each lecture there will be some Moodle um, quizzes um, which are counting 25% uh, of, um, of the homework points. So again register in the system. So altogether we have um, five credit points and per credit points, on point you can count two to three hours of work per week. So together you can expect about um, 10 to 15 hours per week. So that's uh, maybe one and a half working days a week. So that shows that um, the homework uh, can be uh, a considerable amount of time. So that's okay because it's usually programming, right? We will have some Python examples or Python homework to program and that takes time. Right? Writing a program is usually fast but then finding the bugs and getting it to run this is what usually uh, takes time and this is also a skill that you need to develop and you develop skills only by practice. So you need to find out how to uh, find the bugs in your programs and then fix those bugs. So that's actually um, the skill that you need to learn in those uh, homeworks. Yeah, and yeah, as I just mentioned, uh, we will have homework assignments in Python and in the library OpenGL. So that's a fairly common um, open graphics library, originally from C, but also ported to Python. So that's a um, quite well-known library that is used for computer graphics. Yeah, and to make sure the software runs correctly and then there are no installation problems, everybody should use Linux as operating system. So we recommend Ubuntu and we also use Ubuntu ourselves. And this can easily be installed as a dual boot system uh, next to Windows, for instance. And Here's some old link. I'm not sure if it's still working, um, but uh, you can simply take a look at the Ubuntu website here, ubuntu.com. 
where you get some explanations and there are also, there are also more tutorials how to do it if you just Google for it. All right, so usually you would download um, the ISO file from the Ubuntu website, burn it onto a USB stick and then start your laptop or computer from this USB stick. So usually that means you insert it, you restart your computer and during startup um, you push the buttons F2 or F12 or escape depending on your uh, computer and then you get into a startup screen where you can select to start from the USB stick. And once you start from the USB stick it will directly boot into Ubuntu and then you can select install and then it automatically installs as dual boot. So that's actually quite easy and straightforward. You just need to be sure that uh, to make sure that your hard drive has at least about um, 8 gigabytes of um, uh, memory available. Yeah. And also you need to know how to use the terminal shell. Right. All, my lecture, all my examples in the lecture will be for the terminal shell and you also need to know how to operate the terminal shell because that's actually the easiest way to uh, get everything to run. Right. And that means you need to have some knowledge about the command line for Linux, which actually is the same as the command line for Mac OS because it's, built, it's building on the same Unix-like operating system. Yeah, and uh, this is actually um, also part of the goal of the course. You, you need to know how to operate modern computer uh, software, uh, which means Linux um, as operating system and Python. Right? So these are the basic um, engineering um, tools that you need to know. Further, uh, as part of computer animation, we want to be able to uh, build something like an object coder, right? a graphical object. So that means first recognizing an object by a camera, like a webcam. For instance, you um, recognize a head, people's head, and then you create a corresponding model in OpenGL. Um, maybe a sphere, which is shaped like a head, and then you want to display it. right? So for that, you need to have um, prerequisites in math, mathematics. Very important is matrix calculation, right? Matrices like these here, right? Two-dimensional objects or polynomials, uh, right? Polynomials like um, a times x plus um, b times x square and so on. Then we need numerical optimization, right? This is uh, often not taught much in, in mathematics lectures, uh, uh, more like in the advanced sections of mathematics lectures, but it's actually one of the basic toolkits of engineering. So numerical optimization, optimization is very important. Then of course we need computer science, computer graphics, signals and system theory, particularly when it comes to aliasing and the rendering part of um, patterns. Then video technology for um, accessing and processing videos from the camera and also to have computer animation, which is like a video rendering. Yeah, and that leads me to definition of terms. So first, computer animation comes from animation, it's Latin, animare, bringing to life. Or in English, an animation is a cartoon or an animated film. And computer, of course, is an automatic calculation machine, electronic device for storing and processing large amount of information. And in computer animation, we need to, for instance, store three-dimensional moving objects, which means large amounts of memory. Digital processing for, for instance, um, capturing and rendering videos. Discretization of place, time and values, 
when we capture something with a camera, we have individual pixels and these values uh, are discrete. They don't have arbitrary values, but only up to a certain um, accuracy. And uh, we also have only so many frames per second. So that's why we also need to discretize time. Yeah, so for that we need sampling and quantization. Sampling is, for instance, position in time and space. Quantization is the representation of values up to the quantization step size, up to a certain accuracy. Yeah, so the goal here would be to output a two-dimensional image. So maybe I should call this a goal. Goal. Um, yeah, sometimes it's a stereo image pair, um, like when you have um, virtual reality with um, glasses, um, where you have uh, one display for each eye. That's called 2.5D. And sometimes we even have a hologram, which is almost really like 3D because you can move your head around the object. Starting point here is uh, it, for instance, a 3D model of a scene. So this is what we will have most often. And sometimes we have 2D images or drawings, uh, for instance, for uh, some background images. Yeah. So here's an example of a 3D model. So here we have different views from different angles of this object. And here you can see a 3D object of a head. So we have this head represented as points, connected points on the surface. Right? So we start with points. These are then connected with those lines and that gives us the surface of a 3D object. Here's a 2D example. So a drawing, a cartoon drawing, similar here, two dimensional. Your know, application is, for instance, entertainment, as we just saw, film, television, or computer games. Also, data visualization is becoming more and more important. A graphical representation of large amounts of data or of complex processes. Um, there we might have volume data, like from computer tomography or flow fields or from simulations, from flight simulators, vehicle simulators, and so on. So here's an example of a flight simulator. Here we can see this is the flight simulator and inside we have a cockpit, a, a, a more or less a real co cockpit. But then here the scenery that you can see here is generated by computer graphics. And depending on uh, the flight situation, this is also then tilted to give it a more realistic field. Here is an example of tomography visualization. And you can see we have um, data from tomography, which we can then display in different ways and also generate 3D objects of it. Uh, which are then more easily to explore because we can look at it from different angles. Yeah, here's some literature. Um, most important here is this book by Rick Parent, Computer Animation, Algorithms and Techniques. And here are some further, further books, 3D Computer Graphics, then Advanced Animation and Rendering Techniques, Theory and Practice, then computer graphics, principle and practice, and then finally graphic data processing one. Yeah, so then let's start with a short introduction to Python and OpenGL. So I, su I assume that most of you have some experience in Python, um, but if not, uh, you can use um, this um, um, uh, learning by doing to um, get into Python and OpenGL might be new to most of you. So OpenGL is uh, now uh, the most important tool that we have for computer graphics. 
So Python is a powerful object-oriented programming language. At the same time, it does not need to be compiled, but can be interpreted at runtime. It also has a handy command line interface, which makes it easy to try out a few lines of code. So this would be done in the terminal shell, right? In addition, there's an enormous variety of program packages or modules or libraries for it, and all in open source. So that's very practical, everybody can use it, and for students it's for free. So Python is already installed in Linux, for instance Ubuntu. All we have to do there is to install OpenGL in the console window. So what we have to be a little bit careful now is that uh, Python uh, traditionally had two versions, number two and number three, but the support for Python number two stopped early this year. So we should all be using Python 3. And um, depending on the version of Linux, uh, by default you might have installed Python 2. So then you need to install Python 3. But if you freshly install Ubuntu, the newest version, it should already come with Python 3. Right, so when to install a new modular library like OpenGL, in Linux, it's very easy. You just need to open a, sh a terminal shell or console window. So terminal shell and console name the same thing, right? So in Ubuntu, you would, um, for instance, uh, use the shortcut Alt Control T, and then it opens a terminal window. You can also find a terminal window in the um, program menu. So easy enough. So you open a terminal shell or console window and then inside this window you type sudo which is super user do apt and in the meantime you also don't need the get it's just sufficient to type apt right and um, then here you name the packet or the module that you want to install and here you would say python minus opengl Right, and that installs already the desired package. So maybe I can do it here to show you. So here I have my window, my terminal window, and I would just now type this command. Right, so sudo apt install python opengl. Let's see if that works. First, I need to enter my, enter my password, my super user password. Yes, and you can see here, so it's already installed. So not zero upgraded, zero newly installed, zero to remove, um, which means it's already installed, right? Which of course it is. But in your case, you would see that it's doing some download and installing, right? Yeah, and then we can work with OpenGL um, with a command import. So first we would start Python in interactive mode by simply typing Python or Python 3, right? So in my case, it would be Python 3. So let's see if that actually works, because uh, so far my installations are for Python 2. So here I type Python 3, and indeed, you can see here, now we are in the interactive mode of Python 3. So that means now it expects Python commands and not Linux commands anymore, right? So for instance, I can now type 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6, and it, it interprets it actually. So here it gives me the result, or 3.14 pi t times 2, 2 pi, so we have 6.28. So you can actually use this as a pocket calculator, which actually I do. Uh, it's very practical. So now um, you can also import our library, typing import open gl.gl and of course didn't find it because I need to install it for Python 3 so I go back here let's see if it, ha if it has this version 
Uh -huh, it does. So you can see this is how I did it, right? So instead of just Python, I used Python 3 minus OpenGL and then it installed the version for Python 3. So let me now restart Python 3. So this is this was on the Linux command shell and now I'm going back into the Python command line. So now I'm back into Python and using the up arrow to get the previous command import opengl.gl and now it was successful. Another library, sub-library or sub-module is opengl.glut also worked. Great. So now we can start working with OpenGL. We imported now these module or libraries. So that's good. Okay. So most interesting mathematical functions that we will need are in the library NumPy. We import them into Python with import NumPy as NP. Right, so NumPy is another library. It should be installed by default in Linux. So we don't need to do this installation. And this is how you import a library with a short name. So here, NumPy is the original long name, but if you wanna use uh, functions in NumPy repeatedly, you often prefer a shorter name, and that's why we write SNP. So that means after this, we can address all the functions in this library with prepending np. So np.sign, for instance. Yeah, so that means we can now reference the library as np in abbreviated form. Yeah, so this library referencing has the advantage that we can distinguish functions with the same name from different libraries. So for instance, sign is also present in scipy, but has slightly different uh, functionality, right? So this way we can distinguish np sign, np dot sign from scipy dot sign, right? So it's uh, actually good programming practice to have the names of the library in front of the functions uh, from which they came. If you want to have all functions in NumPy without referencing, if there are no duplicates from other libraries, we can also take from NumPy import star, which means everything. But this is uh, what I would not do. I actually discourage from using this because it leads to confusion and bugs, which are then difficult to find. Right? So it takes, for instance, the wrong function and then you um, are puzzled why it does not behave the way it should. Yeah, so interesting command is also, for instance, the help function in Python. So you can just type help and the argument is the function name from which you want to have the help. Right, for instance, help sign. So in our case, it should actually be the way I recommend it, np.sign, right? So, yeah, maybe I can show it. So going back to my window, here I can say import, or write import numpy as np. And then we get, for instance, the sign function, np.sign of 3.14. So what is sine of 3.14? You have to know that the sine and the cosine, all the trigonometric functions, use angles in um, radians. And that means that 180 degrees is represented as pi, or 3.14, 1, 5, and so on. And 360 degrees is represented as 2 pi. So here you would not enter the angle in degrees, but the angle in um, radians. So this would be the sine of 180 degrees. And you know that the sine of zero is zero, the sine of 90 degrees is one, and the sine of 180 degrees is then zero again. 
So you can see it. It's actually quite close to zero, but not exactly zero because this is not exactly pi. There's also a longer version of pi in numpy, in np. So you can type np.py. So here you can see it with more accuracy. 3.1415926535897932 and so on. So now you can have it with more accuracy. But again, it's not um, arbitrary accuracy. So this always stops at some point, but we know that pi is infinitely long. It never stops. So even this does not give, uh, give us the exact 180 degrees, which is what we see here. So here we can see this is 1.2 and so on, e minus 16. And this e minus 16 means times 10 to the minus 16. So what we have here is um, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 16. So here we have um, basically 16 zeros before um, this one, so a tiny number. right? And this is basically showing the um, limit in accuracy that we can expect from Python. Python's accuracy is about 10 to the minus 16. Right, so basically 16 digits accuracy that we can expect. Yeah, and then we can also use help np.sign and here you get the help function for sign and actually uh, the help function not just for sign but for all functions of this type. Right, so it's a class and it's a built-in object and it operates um, element-wise on whole arrays. So you actually can have an array as argument and then it computes the sign of each of the elements of the array. Yeah. You can also type npinfo to get more information or different information. np.info. So this info is again a function in the numpy uh, module. So npinfo. So here you can get uh, more mathematical information. So for instance here, example, np sign of pi over 2 is 1 because this is 90 degrees. Yeah, and this prints signs of an array of angles given in degrees. So here this example is doing this. So we have np sign, here we have this np array. Here we have the degrees in the array in degrees. And here we convert it to radians. So here we divide by 180 and multiply by pi. Right? So this converts these angles in degrees into angles in radians. And here you have the results. And here you can also plot the result. Then you get a nice um, sign function. Um, you, know, you can actually copy this. Copy and paste to try it out yourself. Paste. Here you go. So this would be your x. No, x would be just the np array. Here this would be x. Oh, there's a bracket missing. Hmm. Really? np array. That's strange. That should work, right? NP array. Hmm. Ah. Yes. So this bracket was not necessary. So now we have X. So X is our angles. And now we can say sign NP sign. Sign of X. Then we get the values the sign values of each of those entries. And then we can also plot it. So here we can see how to do it. Um, yeah, so basically we just take th this PLT plot. But for that we have to import matplotlib. So here you can see 
how we import the plotting library, which is also very practical. Paste. So now we have matplotlib pyplot and we abbreviate it as plt. And then we can just copy and paste this one here. Copy, paste. So that means now it plots our x that we just saw on the horizontal axis and the sign of this x on the vertical axis, as we usually do. Right, so now we have generated this plot object. So here we can see we have an object. And to see it, we see we just type plt show like this. And here you can see it. So this is now the result of our sine function from 0 to pi over to pi over 2. Here you can see pi over 2 or 90 degrees. Right. And you can also add labeling as you can see here. So we can also let me plot it again. Plot, and then we can also add an X label. Here, angle and radians. Paste it here. So it generated this object. Now, now it added this label in this object. Now I add copy paste the vertical label and it also has some formatting for the axis tight so let's see what that does and then finally PLT show as we just did right paste yeah so now you can see the result here we have the labels angle and radians and here the sign of those angles yeah what's still missing is the title so we could also add a title so when I just say PLT Type uh, sign function, then it doesn't really work because uh, we already closed um, the, um, the plot, right? So all what's left there is simply my title, but no plot. But this is how you would then add a title to your plot, right? Okay, so back to the slides. Yeah, so in Python, an image, for instance, from a webcam, is displayed as an array. A pixel consists of three values, which is one value per primary color, red, green, and blue. And an example of, for the input of an array in, in Python is this. Right here, this is a simple two-dimensional array. So this would be, for, inst for instance, a black and white um, uh, image. Yeah, so actually this is a numpy array, so you would call it numpy.array or np.array. And Python distinguishes between array and matrices. Right? So matrices are more used uh, for mathematical operations on, mat on matrices, which are two-dimensional arrays. So when we have a two-dimensional array, we can also represent it as a matrix. So a matrix has to be two-dimensional, it cannot be more dimensional, right? So here we have our matrix type. Here we have a second matrix, B. And when we add two matrices, um, see here, matrix type, not array, but matrix. If we add uh, those two, then we have an element-wise addition, as expected from two matrices. For multiplication, we just need to type the star for the multiplication, and if these A and B are matrix types, then we get a mathematical matrix multiplication, right? Not element-wise, but a matrix multiplication. 
If you want to have an element-wise multiplication, then we need to use the NumPy function multiply. Then we get an element-wise multiplication, as you can see here. The type matrix also has an inverse, right? So A as the matrix object has the function i, which is the inverse, right? So this is the inverse here. But in general, you can also use scipy linalg inf as a function. And this scipy linalg inf also works if A is a two dimensional array. So this function is independent of the type matrix or array. Yeah, here's an example of a simple script, Python script. Here we have the function y equals 2a times uh, plus 3, 3 times b um, that shall be programmed as a script. And for that, we uh, create a file with the extension .py, for instance, testscript.py. And we need a text editor for this, right? So it's not like um, um, Microsoft Word or something because uh, they store much more than the, the characters yet that you type but an editor only stores the characters that you type and this is what uh, any programming language actually expects from a program. So I usually use gedit that's standard in Ubuntu and can also be installed in other um, Linux operating systems like on the Raspberry Pi for instance on Raspberry, for instance. So there you can easily install it using the command sudo apt install gedit, so that the get is not really necessary anymore. So I'm going back here, and we can then type the following content. So first, let me open a, my window again. So for and using the, um, the editor, we need to exit the Python command line. So for that, we say quit. And quit like a function, right? Quit is a function with no arguments. So that's why we have these opening and closing brackets. The quit function lets us end. So now we are back into the Linux command line. And there we can open our editor, gedit. So this is our editor. Right, and that's uh, the name of the file we want to edit. If it's um, there already, then it opens this file. If it's not there already, then it creates a new file with this name. So test script.py. And I'm using ampersand to keep the Linux shell usable. So here you can see it's already there with uh, this content. And here you can see the Python commands just as you would type them in the command line, right? So basically, Python then uses those um, uh, entries as entries in the command line um, that we just saw, right? We could get the same result by just copy and paste it into the command line interface of Python that we just saw. All right, so easy enough. And here, this print y lets us um, see the result. And actually, you can see here, I'm using brackets because Python 3 demands brackets. In Python 2, it was um, a command. In Python 3, it is a function. So that's why we need to have the brackets here. All right. So let's see. And then. To execute it, we just, um, there should be no space. To execute it, we again type Python, but instead of hitting return immediately, we give it this argument, right? So here we type again, in this case, Python 3, because I'm using Python 3. And then the argument is test script dot py and now it executes the commands inside this file and gives me the result and then finishes right so it, it's not going and staying into the command line it just executes everything and then finishes 
So here you can see it after return. It just gives me the result and then I'm back into my Linux, com Linux command line, as you can see here. And you can see here I get the correct result 23. Right. So alternatively, we can define a function within Python. So this is useful if you want to, for instance, execute these commands with different values for A and B. Right? Remember in the script those A and B were fixed and each time I want to have a different A and B I would have to rerun those commands, copy and paste for instance, but I don't need to if I define it, this as a function like this. So then you would um, begin your file with this definition, def and then space and then the name of the function and then brackets for the arguments that you plan to have, here a comma b, and then the header is finished with this colon. And then in the lines, uh, lines below, you type a help text, which you will see when you use the help function on my function. And this command uh, is, uh, this comment is um, denoted by those three um, quotation marks in the beginning and here in the end. And this is how you would do a multi-line comment. Right? You would use those three quotation marks in the end and in the beginning and the end and then you can use as many lines as you like. There's also a, a one-line comment mark which is this double cross or number sign. Yeah, so this is then the content. Here are the arguments you can then use inside the body of the function. Here's our formula and then it returns the result. Also note that there is an indentation here, which is maybe not so easy to see here in the slide. Maybe you can add another space here to make it easy, more easily visible. So here this indentation has uh, the function of brackets. Right. So in other operator in other programming languages like C, you would have curly brackets around it. Uh, in Python, this function is taken by this indentation, which has the advantage that it makes it easier, more easy, human readable. Right. It's much easier to see this indentation than searching for brackets. Right. Yeah. So let's take a look. So let me close this editor here. Yeah, I close it. And then I can open the editor gedit for the test function. Test function dot py. Oh, it's not existing. Interesting. Test function oh, with a k. Okay. So this has a K, not a C. Yeah, so here you go. This is my test function. So how do we now use this function? So most often we want to use it inside another program, right? Or for instance, in our Python command line. So we could start Python 3 again. So this would be our calling program now. And then we say, you can see it, import test function. So it uh, should be a K. Let's see if it was the same here. Test function, my function. Yeah, okay. So here, import test function should work import test function let me make it shorter as tst yeah and it doesn't complain so that means it worked and now we can actually use it like in this line here let me scroll a little bit up here so i can just type tst so i made it shorter than this one here and actually this should be a K. Right. Test function. 
So tst dot my function. And now I'm using the arguments seven comma eight. And I'm not getting an error. No attribute my function. Interesting. So now we can check out um, debugging. So let me start another gedit. So now I can simply add another terminal window with control shift n. Then I get another terminal sh um, shell window in the same directory and I can say gedit test function.py and with tab I can do the auto completion to be faster. So here you can see it. Meine Funktion. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Interesting. So it actually has Meine Funktion. It's called My Function. So let me change it here. My Function. So this should now be the right name. So this is also how you would debugging it. Uh, you would always carefully read the, the error message, right? Because that gives you important hints of what's wrong. So here it says module test function, which is what we imported, has no attribute my function. So attribute here means the function name. So I called my function. And it says there is no my function. So what I did is then open um, my file again with a function. And then I saw indeed there was no function with the name my function. It was the German name. So I changed it to the one that I'm using here. And now it should be fine. But first we have to re-import it. I'm not even sure if it's re-importing. Let's see if it's doing it. Yeah, so I guess you have to reload. Um, and that seems to be not so easy. So what I usually do is I actually say quit to make sure everything is deleted. And then I start Python 3 again and say import. I can actually use the up arrow. So here, import test function as TST, and now it should have the newest version. Right? And now we can use TST my test TST my function. And indeed, that's what it does. And um, to avoid this um, actually quitting and restarting, what I found useful is to add a test routine here in this file directly. So here I would um, it, uh, add testing. So here, testing. And that means it would test each time what you would um, um, import or call this test function file. So here you would just add this um, test um, call. So here you would need to import it. So that's why you can't call directly my function with these argument names. And then you should see, uh, you, you would get the result. But here you would not see it directly, but you would need to read it out. So this is the return value. And then you would say print y. OK, so this would then be my testing routine. And then you can conveniently test it as many times as you want by just calling it with Python 3. You would say Python 3 test function dot py. Then it would read in this function. And after reading in this function, it would actually call this function and return the value that it computed. So here you can see it. Indeed, we get the 38. So now every time I make a change here and I recall it, it's automatically updated, right? So that's why this is actually much more convenient for testing a function to have a testing routine here in the main section of your file 
where those functions are tested so that you can see right away if they are working. And you can see even in such a simple function there's plenty that can go wrong, right? as you could see with the function name for instance. So for each function you write you should have a testing routine in the same file to see if it works. Right? So that's basically um, software technology. Yeah, so here it's doing the right thing. Okay. Yeah, so this is what we just did. Yeah, now let's go, come to OpenGL, an example. So the following is a Python OpenGL example for the representation of a 3D wire cube. OpenGL has extensive tutorials on the web, so the functions used there can be found there with explanations. So that's actually one of the big, ex uh, big advantages of Python and also of those Python modules you find up-to-date and extensive documentation, which is really important for software. Right? This function is also a good starting point for own experiments. So the call is made from the console window with this here, Python, again call it with Python, and then the argument wire cube. But first, let's take a look what's inside. Right? So we are curious, we want to see what's inside. Let's take this window here gedit wire cube it's not there so i need to go to python examples i guess where is it hmm hmm interesting where is my wire cube Okay, here it is. So here I have my wire cube. And actually those uh, Python examples, they are also on Moodle 2. So if you go to our Moodle 2 website for our lectures, you will have also those uh, Python examples uh, for download. So here I'm starting again my editor. So here you can see the simple example. Here, first I do the import, as we saw in the beginning, gl, glut, and glu. Here I'm doing import everything, star, so this is what I usually not recommend, but here I did it for simplicity, right? Basically because here everything we do is from OpenGL. So for instance, here this gl matrix mode, this is a function from uh, one of those. Right, so this is already a disadvantage now because you cannot see from which one it came, right? But uh, it makes the code um, somewhat simpler. So first, I start here with a display function, which is to represent um, a model, a three D model, on your screen in a window. So here it defines this displaying uh, function. So here. Um, we define the projection mode. Here we have um, a ortho, orthogonal projection with these um, coefficients. And we will see more about how that means later. Right here, look at. So this is the projection, basically means parallel projection here in this case. Um, and this means the position of our virtual camera, this line here. So it gives a position of our viewpoint. Um, here it de defines um, a color. This should be the background color. Yeah. And then here is the wire cube. And the wire cube is a 3D model which is built in. 
and here I define um, the size of it. Yeah, and then down here basically I run uh, the main loop. So if main equals main, so this has the purpose that this is executed only when we execute wire cube from um, the terminal shell. If this wirecube.py is imported from some other program, then this part is ignored, this testing part or this main execution part. So this is actually what we would also need for testing routines. We should shield any calling function from the testing routine by in including this if name equals main. So maybe I can do that here for my little example. So gedit test function. So here we would add this um, and indent this accordingly because then it's only executed when we call this test function from the terminal shell but not if we import it somewhere else. Yeah. So let me go back to my wire cube window. So here we can see first we init everything then the next what we do is we define the viewing window size 640 times 480 so this is a kind of small window here's the title so it has 3d on top of it which is kind of boring but it shows the purpose here we get uh, we define display mode rgb color here clear color and this should be then um, again the um, background color and here comes now the display routine so here it calls the display function and it's doing the display let's see what it's doing so going to my other terminal here now I can call this function python 3 yes so here you can see it background is white and here we have the wires which are black right so that works and here we have the title 3d so that's how it works so that also means that this here was the wire color that we defined here yeah so that's how you would in principle um, create and display 3d objects so here it was easy for creating the object because it's a built-in object and you could mainly see how we set up the virtual camera and then start the virtual camera. Right. So that worked. Yeah, so here you can see it again. This is what we just saw. And there's also OpenCV. So this is another very practical library, this time for reading from a camera. OpenCV is for open computer vision. Right, so it's not graphics, but vision here. And we can install this using sudo apt install python opencv. So let me try that. So sudo apt install python 3 and CV. Let's see if that works. Password. Continue. Yes. Yes. So here can now see it installs Python 3 OpenCV and you can see it was not installed before on my computer. Probably because I was using Python 2 OpenCV. But since now everything is in Python 3 we should stick with Python 3. So here you can see actually it downloads quite a lot. Different libraries on which it depends, which it uses. Right, so you can see the different libraries it, it installs, downloads and installs. Yeah, so 
downloaded and now it installs. Here you can see it's unpacking the different libraries and installing them. So again it takes a moment for installation but the good thing is everything goes automatically right you just need to execute this one command line and then you just need to wait until it's done like now so it's almost done 99 percent processing triggers yeah now it's done right and now we can take a look at video disp rec disp let's see if it's here um not really interesting i'm missing my python programs okay i found them here so ls video so ls means list, so that's a command line command for showing the content of a directory. And in this case, I'm entering the beginning of a name and then I say star, which means any characters that may come, and end with .py. So here you can see all the files that fit to this description, beginning, video, then anything, and then end .py. So here, video rec disp, so we can see is here. So gedit, that means now we can open it, gedit video rec, so I can use tab for autocompletion, disp.py. So now we can see the content, and here you can see how to use OpenCV. So here you can see it imports the library CV2. So OpenCV has a few uh, sub-modules or sub-libraries, and here I'm using the CV2 sub-module. And this contains the function or the object video capture. Right? Video capture and the zero means uh, the first video camera it can find in the system. And cap is then the pointer to this camera capture. And then here I'm having this infinite loop and here I'm using from this pointer or this object, this is again a, another object, which has the function read. Right? And cap.read simply reads out one frame, one complete frame from the video camera and returns it into the array frame. And if it's a color camera, then this frame array will be three-dimensional because the third dimension consists of those three primary colors. And red is just the binary value which tells uh, if uh, the access was successful or not. So this should be true um, if we have a successful capture. So camera is present. If there is, for instance, no camera present, then red would be false. Yeah, and then we would use cv2.imshow to display the content of this frame in a window on the desktop. And this window has the name frame. And we do this in an infinite loop until we hit the key Q, as you can see here. So wait key waits for a key input. And here is a mask, a binary mask of um, eight ones. And if after masking this corresponds to the ASCII code of lowercase Q, then it breaks this infinite loop and releases all windows and the camera. And you can also see it does this as fast as it can. As it can. Basically here, this means it waits one millisecond. So this is uh, tiny. So in theory, you should get a thousand frames per second in this way, right? But of course, your camera is not able to deliver a thousand frames per second. Hence, it just uh, will be as fast as the camera can deliver um, images or frames, which uh, usually is something around 30 frames per second. So now we can also try it. So Python 3. Yes, so here you can see me uh, from my webcam. 
and now I can press Q and it's closed again. Yeah, so that works. Yeah, so here you can see the code again. Yeah, and that should be it for this part of the lecture. Thanks for your attention and then see you next time.